Well, I want to say welcome to Cross Community Church. If you are a little sleepy this morning, uh, it's okay. I stayed up way too late as well, uh, and I also inhaled way too too much smoke, so you may have to bear with me a a bit as I speak. I I pray that you had a wonderful time with your family. You got to celebrate and enjoy. We are certainly blessed to live in a nation, uh, in the nation that we live in uh, in particular. So today, we're going to continue our series through the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus, he's come into the world. He is, he's beginning to reveal to us this path that leads to life. And he's told us as believers, we're supposed to be salt and light in the world, that when people see us, there ought to be something distinct and unique about us as individuals. Now, Several years ago, I had the opportunity to go visit our our missionaries in China, and I went with my brother-in-law, Justin Jackson. Now, in China, I I might stand out a little bit. I'm I'm not really all that tall. I'm not all that big of a guy. But Justin Jackson, uh, a really big dude wearing overalls in the middle of China, stands out quite a lot. I mean, everyone is looking like, Who is this guy? Like, he's a giant, and what is he wearing? You might feel the same way when you see him in his overalls, but certainly he stood out when we were in China. Now, one day, we went to get a bus ticket. We were going to go visit some missionaries several hours away and and take a bus, where, by the way, if you ever take a bus in China, the smoke thing, they all smoke on the bus, right? And so you get to smoke right along with them, whether you have a cigarette or not. So it was a little bit of a rough trip for us, but as we stood there in line, Justin and I were talking, Talking. Now, we've grown up in Southern American culture. Uh, from my earliest memories as a kid, it's like you stand in line and you wait your turn and you don't cut and you just try to be generally courteous to people. It's not the way it works in China. That's not a, a facet of their culture. And so as Justin and I stood there shoulder to shoulder waiting to buy our bus ticket on this day, this little bitty Chinese woman, she like pushes her way through us, like kind of knocks us a bit, and we're looking at each other like, what just happened? And she kind of pushes her way to the front of the line, and she starts shouting kind of loud, and she's trying to get her bus tickets uh, quicker than we did, obviously. Like, she wanted them right then and right there. It didn't matter to her whatsoever uh, that other people were waiting in line, and that's kind of how things work there. The missionary's like, hey, don't be offended. That's just their culture. Like, they don't have, you know, little pieces of American culture. Some things are better. Some things aren't as good, but just be gracious and patient. This is the way things work. Now, as much as that felt weird to us, like, no, listen, there's a better way to go about this. Like, if everyone's trying to push and shove and shout their way to the front of the line, like, things don't go very well, in particular, when you're in a bus station and you're trying to get a ticket to get where you're going, like, you should just wait in line. Like, for us, we've been immersed in a culture uh, that did things a different way, I would argue a better way. We should probably all wait in line. And so it felt really odd to us to be in a culture where people weren't courteous. They weren't respectful. They weren't like careful to, hey, excuse me, or those sorts of things. They, they just act a bit differently there. In the same way for us as believers... We should be so immersed in the culture of God's kingdom, in the culture that's revealed to us in the scripture, the lifestyle that Jesus taught us, that when we go out and we live in the place where we've lived, we're a part of American society, it ought to feel a little bit different to us. We ought to live and think, you know what, there's there's a better way to do this. There's a better way to be a father in this culture. There's a better way to be a mother or a husband or a wife. There's a better way to conduct business. There's a better way, and we ought to feel that way because Jesus taught us a better way. There's a quote that Matt Duke, our campus pastor at our Pecola campus, uh, references rather frequently. It's by C.S. Lewis, and he said this about us um, as as Christians. He says, We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, When infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. He says we are far too easily pleased. In this life, many of us, we we, kind of go along with culture. We, we get, um, it, it, it happens to us, right? We get accustomed to this is how we're supposed to live. And C.S. Lewis says we're making mud pies in a slum. 
Well, what Jesus is inviting us to do is to come and enjoy a holiday at sea, to experience a greater joy than we've known before, to experience the abundant life that is available to us in Christ Jesus, fullness of joy. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is like, hey, I want to show you something. And I want to show you how to live. I want you to come and follow me. And so we're going to continue this series today, walking through the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43. Now, he's been in a section that's known as the Antitheses, where he would reference something uh, that they would have known would have been kind of a religious saying in their culture. Some of these were verbatim quotes from the Old Testament. And you'll, you'll see today, some of them are not. Some of them uh, are, are kind of fabrications even. So Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43, here's where Jesus begins. He says, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor. And all of us just say, yeah, Brandon just read that to us. It's, I mean, throughout the scriptures, we are commanded or taught to love our neighbor. But, but then Jesus is going to reference something that they would have believed He says, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, the problem with that is that that nowhere in Scripture are we ever taught to hate our enemy. There are some things in the Old Testament about um, not making treaties with certain types of people. Um, The the Bible does reference people who hate God. Um, The Bible nowhere commands us to hate our enemy. And yet he's speaking to devout Jews, religious leaders, who when Jesus says, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, they were all like, yep, I've been taught that. You see, they weren't taking their cues from Christ as much as they've been taking their cues from culture. You know, the same can be true for us. That we get really, really good at at going along with the way that culture would tell us to go. This is how you're supposed to act. These are the standards of our day. Unfortunately, these very devout religious people could have quoted tons of the Old Testament, lived really devout lives. They'd been influenced as much by their culture as they had by Christ and the Word of God. So Jesus, he's going to correct this fairly significant misunderstanding for them on this day. He goes on, he says, um, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, you should love your enemies. You should pray for those who persecute you. Like there's something different about the people of God living as salt and light in the world where the world might, or the culture might tell us, yeah, uh, love your enemies and, and hate your, I'm sorry, <laughs> love your neighbor and hate your enemies Jesus is like, no, we're going to do it differently. The people of God, we're going to represent God in this world. We're going to love even our enemies. We're going to pray for those who persecute us. Look down uh, verse 46. He's talking about, here's how culture does things. This is how the world would, would operate. Verse 46, he says, If you love those who loves you, love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do that? Tax collectors would have been like the worst of sinners in their society. Don't even the worst of sinners love people that love them in return? You're supposed to be salt and light. If you only love those people in your life that are giving it all back, that are the lovable type people that agree with you, that affirm your ideas, that are, you know, patting you on the back every day, don't, isn't that how the worst of sinners live? He continues in verse uh, 46 there, or verse 47. He says, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? The Gentiles were unbelievers in this context. Isn't that how the world lives? The implication is that Jesus hasn't called us to be just like the world. We're supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to be unique in our culture. Jesus says, I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If if love is the command here, it's important that we understand what Jesus meant by love. Because love means a lot of things, doesn't it? We love to watch fireworks on the 4th of July. We love to blow stuff up. We love to see fire. We love lots of stuff in our culture. What is Jesus specifically talking about when he calls us to love our enemies? Um, I want to remind you of the old school DC Talk song. If you're uh, of my generation, the word love, hey, 
Love is a verb, right? It's supposed to be an action. We're supposed to do things as believers. So the way that we've defined love here at Cross Community, it's not a perfect definition because the Bible doesn't give us a perfect definition other than the person of Jesus. But we say to love is to sacrificially seek the good of another person. Sacrificially seek the good of another person. And so Jesus would say, I want you to love your enemies and I want you to pray for those who persecute you. And not the prayers that some of us might want to pray for people who persecute us. Like, God, it's time for you to bring it down on them. Like, that, that's enough. Like, just take them out of here. I've had enough of those people. But instead, that in our prayers, for even people that oppose us and disagree with us, that persecute us, that we would consider to be an enemy or an opponent, we should sacrificially seek their good, laboring in prayer on their behalf. She's like, you want to be salt and light? It's going to look a little different. You don't hate those who persecute you. You don't hate your enemies. You love them. You sacrificially seek their good. Work on behalf of another person. Verse 44 says, I'm sorry, verse uh, 40, yeah, 44 says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So that people will see your behavior, the way that you love other people and be like, oh, those are Christians. Those are children of God. Those are people who have given their life to Christ the way they love. And he, he points out the way that God loves. Verse 45, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. I want to say this to us. Church, we have to be really, really careful as we approach loving our neighbor and obedience to Christ in this regard, we have to be really careful to know what love is. It's actively seeking the good, sacrificially seeking the good of another person. Because of this, we fall short. See, like Jesus didn't say, um, love your enemies and don't hate, or love your neighbors and don't hate your friends, right? Or your, your enemies. Like, don't, it's not avoidance of hate. He commands us to actively love. And so there is this possibility that we could go through our lives, man, loving our neighbors, not hating our enemies, but also not loving our enemies. That we fall short of God's standard of love, not just in active hatred towards somebody, but also in passive indifference toward them. I, I scrolled through social media. I, our, our society, our culture with words and things, everything has to be inflammatory. I think it's profoundly unhelpful. Um, scrolling through social media the other day, uh, I found uh, the careless use of the word hate, like a half a dozen times in just like a, a couple of minutes there. Uh, I saw a post about um, suggesting that uh, a certain group of people hates uh, black people. Uh, I saw a post about hating the police, a post about hating women, a post about hating people of various sexual persuasions, a post about hating America, a post about hating Donald Trump, and you've probably felt it too. Everywhere we look in culture, we're accused of hating somebody and like, you know, not wanting their good. Like somehow we must have these broken, malicious, hateful hearts. And I think it's profoundly unhelpful because I believe for most of us, we would say, no, 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 I've checked my motives. Like, I've looked in my heart. I don't hate anybody. Like, and, and, and you're probably right. Like, I, I believe it's probably true for most of us that we're not actively hating anyone. Now, if it is true of you, uh, you need to repent of that, right? But we don't repent uh, just to the point where we, to where we become indifferent toward people. Our repentance toward our brother or our enemy needs to be up unto love. Not that we stop short of love, but we know we no longer hate and so we're good. But instead, Jesus says, love them. Sacrificially seek the good of your brother. I read a blog this week that was really enlightening to me. It was a young lady. She, in the blog, she's chronicled a lifetime of depression. I want you to see the results of indifference toward our brothers or our sisters or even our enemies. Now, again, most of us would say we're not actively hateful in this room. Like, no, I don't actively hate anyone. But passive indifference can be just as damaging. This is the blog this young lady wrote about her father. I want to read you just a quick paragraph that she wrote. 
of her father, she said, mostly he just doesn't care. He doesn't listen when I talk to him. He doesn't know anything about me. He doesn't know about my life or my kids because he doesn't care to know, and he doesn't listen to anyone who tries to tell him. She said, my, my father is regarded as a nice guy. That was his reputation in the community. He's never violent, he's never mean, and he's never hurtful with his words. The truth is, his relationship style is dismissive and disinterested, all of which is very hurtful. I spent many years in childhood and adulthood begging my father to notice me. The fact that he didn't wasn't as very hurtful. There's a very loud message that's delivered to me every time I'm disregarded. The message is, I don't matter. I'm not important. I'm not worth listening to. I don't have anything to contribute to his life. She writes, love is an action and love doesn't damage Loved ones aren't insignificant. In his life, the action parts of the word love are missing. Now, many of us in this room could think about our fathers, and we wish that some of the things were true about our fathers that were true about hers. Like maybe you've grown up in a home where it was abusive, where there was violence, where there were hurtful words, and you thought what you really wanted in life was the, to, the absence of those things. Like, I, don't, I wish I had a father who wouldn't speak to me in that way. I wish I had a father who wasn't violent, a father who wasn't mean. And yet this young lady finds herself a father who could be described in all of those ways. And yet inwardly broken, not from a father who was hateful or actively mean, but from a father who's passively dismissive, who just ignored her, who just didn't care. You see, love is active. Many of us could describe ourselves again. We're not hateful toward anybody We've checked our hearts. We don't want to harm anyone. But could it be true that we're guilty of being passively dismissive toward our brother? Of falling short of the standard of Jesus Christ that he's called us to, to love even our enemies. This young lady felt like she didn't matter. She wasn't important. She wasn't worth listening to. She's chronicled her lifelong battle with depression and said the, the message her father sent her every single day felt like a death sentence. I don't believe many of us hate our brothers. It's why we're, we have a tendency to roll our eyes or tune people out when they tell us that we supposedly hate them. But could it be true of us that like that father, we're never violent, we're never mean, we're never hurtful with our words, but neither are we loving. Now, rather than being salt and light to the world, we just blend in. The church of Jesus Christ isn't recognized as sons and daughters of God, of Jesus, as Christians, followers of him, but instead, we're just like the rest of culture. Could it be true of us that like in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the story Jesus told about the man who was going down from Jerusalem, robbers fell upon him, they beat him, they stripped him naked, they robbed him of all that he had, and they left him there on the side of the road dead. Could it be true of us that we're a little bit like the priest and the Levite, patting ourselves on the back? I would never rob someone. I would never beat anybody. There's not a mean bone in my body. But also be true of us that like the priest and the Levite, we just walk by on the other side of the road, passively indifferent to our brothers and sisters. The standard that Jesus called us to is love sacrificially seeking the good of even our enemies? Could it be true of us that seeing people in the ditch has become normal? So much so, we see it every single day, LaFleur County, we see addiction, we see abuse, we see poverty, and it's just normal. We walk this road every day. That person's been in the ditch for years. And could it be that in the midst of the brokenness of our society today, the outcries that we hear, that we long to return to normal more than we long to help the person in the ditch? Jesus says, you have heard it said, 
Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, that's not good enough. I want you to love your neighbor. And I want you to love your enemy. He's going to give us some examples of what that looks like. Um, look down in verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 47. There's a really interesting thing that that Jesus turned to in talking about loving our brothers. Now, most of us would say, love love your neighbor, love your enemy, um, pray for them, like be there for them. He he uses greeting as an example of a way that we could love our brothers and sisters. In verse 47, he says, If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. It stood out to me in the text, like why would Jesus talk about greeting people? Because... What's the big deal? Like, shake a hand, you know. How you doing? Whatever. It doesn't seem to be all that big of a deal. Uh, I looked into this word in the Greek. Um, the word greet here is espadzomai, and it means to draw to oneself. It means to receive someone joyfully. It means to wish them well. Greetings, and in particular in the time of Jesus, I think it ought to be true of us today, greetings were an acknowledgement of one's presence and importance and of our concern for them. They say, you matter, I'm glad you're here and I care about you. I'm for you, I wish you well, I want good for you. So the church of Jesus Christ, in greeting people, in everyday casual interactions, we have an opportunity to love But rather than moving on to the other side of the road, rather than just kind of casually passing by, to give even a greeting that that we're going to give some energy and thought to, we're going to give attention to, and a greeting that says, you matter to me, you're important, I love you. The people of God, Jesus says, hey, the Gentiles, they greet their friends. Lost people greet people that love them in return. But the church of Jesus Christ, you want to know greater joy You want to leave the mud pies and begin to journey toward this holiday at sea. The greater joy that's available in me, start loving in this way. Don't settle for what culture gives you. It's easy to fall back into that. For the salt to lose its saltiness and the light to be hidden somewhere. But we're to stand out in the way that we love one another, sacrificially seeking the good of other people, even to those who oppose us. Look look what he says up in verse 38. He's going to give us some examples. And this is hyperbole, by the way. I mean, Jesus is working really hard to teach us how we should respond to people who oppose us. Look what he says in verse 38. He says, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, this is straight out of Scripture. This was some of the Old Testament law that was given for like retaliatory purposes, like to govern. So um, what you didn't get to do was someone knocks your tooth out and you get to take their life, right? So the law would say if someone knocks your tooth out, you can have a tooth. It just kind of governed retribution, if you will. But Jesus is like, wait a minute. Like, this should never be something you're going to stand on and try to get something from your brother. This should never be something that you're going to be like, oh, the law says... You you gouged out my eye, so I get yours in return. That doesn't work out very good for either one of you, right? You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, don't resist an evil person. Now, resistance here, this, this word should make you think of a courtroom, a legal situation where someone has injured you in some way. Uh, a slap here uh, on the cheek that he's going to describe. Um, it would be an insult. It would be some level of harm done that you would think about it in this context. You're in the courtroom standing before a judge saying, he hit me and I get to hit him back. She insulted me and so I'm going to insult her back. And so Jesus says to those who injure you, to those who insult you, in this case he uses a slap on the cheek. He says, whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other toward him also. Salt and light in the world, loving our brother and sister, as Jesus has called us, says, I'm not going to seek retribution. I'm not going to seek revenge. I'm not going to trade insult for insult and harm for harm. But instead, I'm going to stay here with you. Now, what Jesus is not teaching is that you just need to take a beating, right? That's not the goal here. But Jesus is showing us how we are to respond uniquely in our culture when people sin against us. It doesn't mean you can't ever seek, like if someone steals your stuff, you can never go to court. It doesn't mean that that you don't have any legal representation, but your heart toward your fellow man is one of love and not of revenge. 
Verse 40, he says, If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him another. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Jesus reminded us of God and his relationship with us. So think about this. You sinned against God. I've sinned against God over and over and over and day after day after day. The law says you and I deserve punishment for that. Justice says we should be punished. We should endure the just penalty for our sins. But we are men and women who because of the goodness and the mercy and the grace of our God, not only did we not have to pay the just penalty for our sins, God paid it for us. He's like, hey, you want to be recognized as sons of your father, daughters of your father? This is how you act in the world. This is how you live toward people that mistreat you. You love them in return. And you see someone who wants your, your, your shirt Hey, give them your coat too. Seek their good. Pursue them. Stay there with them. Desire their welfare. Act on behalf of your brother. Keep your eyes open, not just to the one who loves you, but even to the one who might oppose you. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Uh, it's a passage I preach all the time at weddings, right? Because that's the only time we really love people is if we marry them. But not really. Um, it, it's a passage that describes what love should be. And so at first it says, uh, love, you'll see, love is and what love isn't. So he, he begins, he says, love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It doesn't brag. It's not arrogant. It doesn't act unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. It doesn't take into account wrong suffered. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things and believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Jesus says, uh, someone strikes you on the cheek, they insult you, they harm you. Don't take into account wrong suffered. Love is patient. It's kind. Someone wants to sue you and take your shirt. Respond in love. Give him your coat also. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Love is patient and kind. Endures all things. Someone asks of you, give it. Love doesn't seek its own. Jesus is like, hey, the world teaches you really well how to make a mud pie. The problem with mud pies is they're really, really poor imitations of anything good. They're not going to satisfy anybody. Matter of fact, they'll just make you sick. And then Jesus invites us to greater joy as the people of God to be salt and light in our world to experience the life that he died on the cross to purchase for us. Rather than half-hearted disciples who just blend in with our culture, that take all of our cues from what we see on the news or how other people might respond, and instead, Jesus says, love your neighbor. And I say to you, love your enemy too. Pray for those who persecute you. Greet those, even those that you don't know and that might even be your your opponents or your enemies. Go out of your way to sacrificially seek the good of other people. We should be distinct from culture. Like my brother-in-law in China in a pair of overalls, believers ought to be distinct in our culture. People ought to see something unique in us and regard us as children of our father. Last year, there was a story that really it engaged our entire nation. I heard people talking about it. It was all over the news. The police officer, Amber Geiger, uh, I don't know all the circumstances around what she did, but she walks into the apartment of a man named Botham Jean while he sat on on his couch eating ice cream. And there she shot and killed him. 
She was convicted of the crime. And in the sentencing portion where the families have a chance to uh, address uh, the person who's harmed in this case and murdered their brother, there was an 18-year-old boy. His name was Brant Jean, the brother of Botham, who was killed sitting there on his couch. And the, the question was, do you have anything to say to Amber, the woman who had killed his brother? You, man, you need to look it up. If you haven't watched the video, this 18-year-old young man in love. He asked the judge, he says, can I give her a hug? I think like, the judge doesn't respond for a while like, what? That's not how this goes. He goes, steps down off the witness stand there where he was, and for 60 long seconds, he embraced the woman who murdered his brother. He said the words to her. He said, I love you, and I don't want anything bad for you. He told her he wanted the best for her and encouraged her to give her life to Christ. And our nation took notice. Because that's not how it goes in our culture. That's not what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to curse her. He was supposed to wish bad on her. He was supposed to wish that she never saw the light of day again. But instead, the light of gospel shone in that moment. Church, I believe this. That our greatest opportunity to witness to the world may be in the midst of what we suffer. Even tax collectors love their own brothers. The Gentiles, they greet the people that love them in return. But the church is going to love our enemies. We're going to be the ones that are known because we took notice. We're not passively indifferent to people that were living life right alongside. Instead, we act on their behalf. We sacrificially seek their good. Can I ask you for just a second to think, who's hurt you? Who's sinned against you? Who's caused you pain? And I know some hurts are really deep. But in the midst of your pain, can you hear the voice of Jesus saying, hey, I want to show you greater joy. Maybe in the midst of your hurt, you have an opportunity to be light in darkness, to be salt, to witness to the goodness that God has already shown you, that though you sinned against him, he died on your behalf. So as the church of Jesus Christ, we have a chance to forgive. We have a chance to move toward one another in love, to turn the other cheek, to be reconciled to our brother, to overlook an offense, to not take into account wrongs suffered. We live in a world that sees us as indifferent. But we don't care and we have an opportunity to show them otherwise. We have the opportunity to love as Jesus has called us to love. As we conclude our service every week, we give you an opportunity to respond to the message. And in just a minute, I'm going to invite you to respond. And that's to respond in obedience. Not to, to hear the word of God and then to, I don't know, deceive ourselves, but not to live it out, but to hear the word of God and say, God, I want to live that. I want to be salt. I want to be light. So I have three ways I want to invite you to respond today. The first is if you've not come to know the love of Jesus Christ for you, do not come to understand how much you sinned against Jesus, but how much he loved you in return, that he offered his life on the cross to make an atoning sacrifice, paying the penalty for your sin. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to trust Jesus, to come place your faith and trust in him, to let the light of God begin to shine into your heart, that it might then begin to be reflected in your life. If you're a believer Today may be a day of repentance for you. If you have hatred in your heart toward your brother, your enemy, anybody, it's, it's a day of repentance. As Jesus invites you to greater joy, you repent. But maybe 
It's not a day to repent from hatred, but it's a day to repent of our indifference. Maybe as we look around us in LaFleur County, there's some people in the ditch. Some people who have been left for dead. We've just been walking past. And maybe today's the day for you just to begin to love your neighbor and love your enemy in a different way. That when you leave here, you pick up the phone and you call somebody that you haven't loved well. And you haven't sacrificially sought their good. You haven't hated them, but you haven't pursued them either. You haven't been reconciled to them. Maybe you're carrying around bitterness and unforgiveness. As we pray, I want to invite you to ask God this question. God, who do you want me to love? God, who's that person that I need to show this kind of love to? Would you bow with me? Father, we are people who have received extraordinary love. God, it's described in the song with the word reckless because we don't know how to say it better than that. We have sinned against you day after day, time after time, and God, you still sent your son to die in our place. Lord, as your people, I pray that we don't just take that for granted, that we don't take it lightly and treat it like it was no big deal. But God, we would see our sin for what it was, for the pain that it caused you. And we would see the sacrifice of your son, what he truly endured for us. And Lord, I pray that we too would love not just our neighbor, but also our enemies. That we as Cross Community Church would be salt and light in our world. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.